today's video is brought to you by Casetify. Go to casetify.com slash Kendall to save 15% off your order. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. So happy to have you here for another true crime video. This one is very, very interesting. If you are new to my channel, welcome. So today we are talking about Linda Stein, who was a very famous realtor. She worked with a lot of celebrities and she was very well off and successful. She also was involved in the music industry for some of her life as well. So she was just really well known. And we're going to be talking about her death, which occurred in October 2007. And it's quite a story. So buckle in and let's begin. So Linda Stein, she was born on April 24th, 1945 in Manhattan and raised in the Riverdale neighborhood of the Bronx, New York. Her parents were Mabel and Ira Alder, and she had one sister named Arlene. And those who grew up with Linda describe her as the rebel who was always pushing the boundaries. She was really blunt. She could be very pushy to other people, but those who knew her said that she was really funny and a fun time to be around most of the time. And early in her career, Linda actually worked as a fifth grade teacher in her hometown of Riverdale. And that job was pretty short lived because she ended up being hooked up with the uncle of one of her students. And he introduced her to a whole new life. This man was music executive Seymour Stein. He was president of Sire Records and vice president of Warner Brothers Records. The two of them ended up getting married in 1971 and they had two daughters named Mandy and Samantha just a few years after they got married. And when she met Seymour, she left teaching and joined the world of rock and roll where she very successfully built a career managing some of the most well-known bands of that decade. After Seymour signed the Ramones in 1975, this was obviously huge for them and Linda ended up co-managing the band and helped really launch them into stardom. Seymour worked with a lot of really famous people, one of those people being Madonna. And because of their jobs, they were able to really get in the celebrity circles and spend a lot of time partying with the most elite people during the 1970s. Elton John, for example, was one of the close friends that Linda made during this time, and their friendship was something that she was happy to boast about whenever she could. <laughs> she always loved to name drop Elton John. I mean, who wouldn't? Linda really made a name for herself in the American rock music scene. She was known as a sassy, smart, and tough manager who always got her talent to the next level. Linda had a personality that was kind of bigger than life. And she had a temper that was bigger than life. A lot of people describe her temper as volcanic. And that seems to be part of the reason why she was so successful. I mean, she just would not take no for an answer. She was tough. She was the farthest thing from a pushover. Her co-manager, Danny Fields, said that Linda never wanted to be in a bland situation. She was always looking for the most exciting things in life. And he said that she was one of the most honest people that he had ever met, but a little too honest at times. You know, she didn't really have a filter and she was a little abrasive for some. And, you know, it cost her some friendships along the years. Some people just thought she was way too much to deal with. Her favorite word was fuck. Honestly, same. And Linda was known for using it at least 20 times a day. Linda was not ashamed of the fact that she was a very loud person, that she was outgoing, and she really embraced her temper and her brutal honesty. She was pretty small. She was only five foot three, but that didn't stop her from always being the biggest and loudest person in the room. So her marriage to Seymour didn't last that long. It only lasted about eight years. And in 1979, the two of them began arguing over their spending habits mostly and who had dibs on certain celebrity friends. But even though their marriage came to an end and they definitely did have some fighting towards the end, they decided to remain friends, which is great for their kids. And the two of them actually shared a glass of champagne on the same day they signed their divorce papers. Linda continued on working as a rock music manager in the start of the 80s, but fell into a new career passion when she discovered real estate. Linda really got started in the real estate market in the 1980s when she brought her ex-husband's apartment to the attention of Edward Lee Cave, who was a real estate broker for Sotheby's. She was given a pretty big finder 
manager's fee, and also the opportunity to get three more commissions on other sales that year. Linda knew that she would be really good at real estate, that she had the connections, the ability to schmooze people. She knew she could be successful and she was instantly hooked. And not only did real estate give her the money and the glamour that she had always been used to, but it gave her the opportunity to continue working along these big name celebrities that she had spent a decade getting to know, but she was kind of slowing down in the music industry. So this was the perfect transition and Linda became a force in luxury real estate. When she was talking to clients, she knew how to talk to them, how to make them feel comfortable and heard because she understood their needs. You know, she lived pretty much the same lifestyles and she knew how to get them what they wanted. Linda always said that she never sucked up to her clients, that instead she treated them like fifth graders because... To her, that's what they were. She always said they need to be told what they want. And I do that for them. And supposedly, Linda is the inspiration behind two movie characters, one of them being the real estate agent in Wall Street, and then a record executive in the movie 54. By the early 1990s, Linda was really killing the game with real estate. She was making tons of sales, working with tons of famous clients, and tabloids started referring to her as Realtor to the Stars. And that really stuck. And that's what Linda was known as, the Realtor to the Stars. She found apartments for Madonna, for Sting, for Angelina Jolie, Billy Joel, Bruce Willis, Elton John, Steven Spielberg, and many, many more. She became the person to work with if you were a celebrity in need of luxury living. In March of 1990, she left Edward Cave and accepted a very lucrative position with Douglas Elliman. And with this new job, she was guaranteed 65% share of all commissions which would typically be 50-50. She got a private office, a personal assistant, and a chauffeured BMW. So she was living large. And that same year, she was featured on page six, which is a gossip column, eight times. And this was a big deal. Linda had really made it. She was featured in the news often, and she loved it. She was soaking that up. Some people say that Linda was even connected with some of the gossip columns, like had inside sources, and she was feeding them information, helping herself get in there as much as possible, because the more she was featured anywhere, the more her ego was fed. And a lot of people said that they were nice to Linda simply because they were afraid of her and afraid that she would talk badly about them to others and start rumors. But it was this attitude and power that was really driving her success. And like I said, feeding her ego. She felt better than ever and more powerful than ever. On a good year, Linda would sell 11 apartments, making her millions in profits. And in the mid 90s, she hit $25 million in sales for three consecutive years. And Linda really liked to live large. She liked to spend a lot of that money that she earned. Once her daughters were old enough to move out, she bought herself a luxury penthouse in a building called the Canilworth in Central Park West. This was a super fancy building that a lot of celebrities lived in, and it was in a great location. Now, Linda was a really heavy drinker and it became a problem for her on many occasions in her life. And sometimes she would go and seek help through AA, but she never really took it seriously. In fact, she told people around her that she didn't even think it worked. Eventually she got really into smoking weed and she smoked a lot of weed. People said that she would just chain smoke joints all day. In the mid 1990s, Linda was diagnosed with breast cancer and she was at a really high point in her career. So she did not want to slow down, but she ended up smoking a lot more just to cope with the pain. She also said that it really helped counteract some of the side effects of the medications that she had to take to combat the cancer. And people around her said that Linda didn't seem afraid, at least not publicly, about the cancer and that she kind of treated it like any other challenge in her life. She had her first mastectomy and breast reconstruction in 1994 and her second mastectomy in 1996. And Linda was very public about her battle with cancer. She even joined Evelyn Lauder's Breast Cancer Research Foundation, where she was instrumental in raising millions of dollars for breast cancer research. She even got Elton John to perform at a fundraiser for the foundation in 2001. And Linda was known for helping a lot of people who were diagnosed with breast cancer, you know, 
kind of deal with it emotionally and physically because she understood the toll it took on them. Those who are close with Linda during this time say that her fight with cancer was really a defining part of her character in the 90s. So then in 2006, Linda was getting a scan and her doctors ended up finding a large brain tumor. Luckily for her, x-rays revealed that the tumor was benign, so non-cancerous. But because of where it was pressing onto her brain, she was put on mood stabilizers and a couple of other drugs. And as I explained before, Linda was prone to mood swings before even getting this diagnosis. But all of that drastically increased once she had this tumor. And not only were her moods way less predictable at this time and really just up and down, she also was becoming more and more weak from the medications that she was on. Her daughters said that there was times where Linda could barely even hold up her own hairdryer. So like I mentioned earlier, Linda signed with Douglas Elliman and a lot of perks came with that, including having a personal assistant. Now her first personal assistant, Linda was not too into, and she fired her in 2007. Linda was very abrasive and a bit aggressive towards her assistants, like very demanding. Working for Linda was a tough gig and that she would openly talk about how she would want people fired that she worked with all the time, especially assistants. A lot of people have straight up said that Linda was a bully to her assistants. Her temper was extremely short, especially after the brain tumor, and it often impacted her relationships both professionally and personally. She also had a pretty abrasive relationship with her own daughters, and she was heard one time saying, I'm not talking to that bitch in reference to one of her daughters. So around this time, a temp staffing agency called Axion sent her 26-year-old Natavia Lowry. Natavia was born and raised in the Great Housing Projects in the borough of Manhattan, New York. She was an only child and she was raised primarily by her mother, Lottie, and her father died when she was only a baby. At one point, everyone in her family saved up enough money for Natavia to attend Bishop Laughlin Memorial High School to get a good education. But Natavia was kicked out of that school and she ended up having to finish at a public school called Murray Bergtrom High. While she was there, she was on the track team. She enjoyed studying criminal justice, ironically enough, and she also considered modeling in college. The year following high school, Natavia was a temp at a PR firm called Rogers and Cohen. And then she went to college at North Carolina State University. And she did end up pursuing modeling in college with a group called Black Finesse. Natavia decided not to finish college and ended up going straight straight to work instead. Her family described her as an extremely kind person that she would never hurt a fly. But other people who knew her don't feel the same way. They said there was just a different side to Natavia that a lot of people didn't see. Natavia was sued in Virginia for not paying her rent. It was a small amount, like 500-ish and her family said that this isn't a fair accusation because it was actually her roommate's remaining rent amount that that person kind of ditched her and then she was stuck with it. So that's why she didn't pay. She was also accused of stealing $3,000 from a former employer in Virginia. A girl that she went to high school with said that Natavia opened credit cards at different stores like Target in her name and would rack up debt for her. And they were small amounts, like $300 on each card. And when this girl sued her, Natavia said that it was her boyfriend, not her. That girl called her a pathological liar. So who knows? And before she became the assistant to Linda Stein, she was actually working at Planned Parenthood. But her staffing agency, sent her to Douglas Elliman, where she connected with Linda. And at first, working for Linda was a great opportunity for her, and she liked Linda to some degree. This was in 2007 that she started. And at first, she was doing pretty typical assistant work. She was making phone calls. She was typing out contracts, tracking lists and appointments, setting up showings, etc. But after a few weeks, Linda began requesting more personal help from Natavia. She would have Natavia help her do her hair, go run personal errands for her, 
accompanying her on walks because she didn't like to be alone. Working for Linda was a tough job. I mean, Natavia was dealing with doing all these personal things and she sometimes questioned whether or not she should be doing those things. And sometimes it was just a lot on her plate. But at the same time, she needed this job. It was the best job she had had. And she was sure that it was going to kind of push her into the next stage of her career one day. And that working for Linda and kind of taking the attitude and dealing with all this shit was worth it. And even though she was very frustrated with Linda a lot of the time, Natavia also said the two of them got along fairly well. She also does personal tasks for Stein, even washing her hair and accompanying her on her walks and her jogs every day. Linda would give her advice on stuff. And one time she even paid for her boyfriend to come out and visit her. And so that was pretty nice. But sometimes she would just lose her temper with Natavia. And it wasn't just Natavia, it was everyone in her life. Her medications were really having an effect on her mood. And she started kind of resenting how much she relied on Natavia. She was a very independent person and having to, you know, put all that on someone else was embarrassing for her. But behind the scenes of everything going pretty well, Natavia was actually stabbing Linda in the back from the beginning. She was stealing from her. Almost from the day that she started working for her, she started stealing from Linda. Using Linda's accounts, Natavia would withdraw hundreds of dollars from ATMs, and she did so undetected. And in the first few weeks of working for Linda, Natavia found out that she was pregnant. And a lot of people believe that some of that money she was taking out was being sent to her baby daddy who lived back in Virginia Beach. Now, it is unknown if Linda actually knew that Natavia was stealing from her. Many people believe that she did, though. Even the police believe that she, at some point, figured out what was going on and that her knowing what was happening actually led to what happened next. So that brings us to October 2007. Mandy, Linda's daughter, was staying with her for a few weeks. And on October 30th, she left the apartment around 9.30 a.m. to go out and work on a documentary that she was producing. That night, she returned to the apartment around 10.30 p.m., and she was not prepared for what she was about to walk into. As soon as she walked in, she saw a body lying in a pool of blood in the living room. And at first she couldn't tell who it was because there was so much blood and it was dark. So it took a few seconds to sink in, but eventually it hit her. This was her mom. Linda was lying on the floor of her luxury apartment lying in a pool of blood. So Mandy immediately called 911 and she actually called from both her cell phone and her landline, hoping that this was going to get help there faster, I believe. And you'll hear when I play this call that at some point she is so distraught that she has to hand the phone off to a friend of hers that happened to be with her. Please, I need an ambulance. Okay, what happened then, ma'am? Uh, my mom, she's dead, I think. I don't know. Help me, help me. Hello? Help me. Hello? What happened? I came home and my mom is in a puddle of blood. Can you just send something? Yes, right ma'am, I sure can. Miss, miss. Hello? Yeah, patient breathing and awake. Is this 911? Yes, it is. It's for a male or a female? For a female. Uh, she's lying on the floor, a lot of blood from her head. Uh, the daughter just came in and found her like this. She's bleeding heavily, sir. It's important. She's bleeding heavily. She's not moving. Uh, what happened? She felt she hurt herself? I don't know. Listen, Mr. Is she conscious? Yes or no? She's not conscious. She's not moving. Big question now. Is she, breathing? Is she breathing, sir? She's not breathing. She's not breathing. I don't think so. I can't. I can't see her. If I give you that, she's lying face down. Hello, mister. Okay, the ambulance is en route to that location. She's 62. Thank you, mister. So when police got there, they first thought that this was a terrible fall. However, they started looking closer and they pulled her hood back. And that's when they saw how much blood was on and around her head. And they realized that Linda was 
beat in the head with a heavy object. They also noted that nothing was stolen from the apartment. Everything was in its place. Everything looked normal. She was not sexually assaulted and there was no sign of forced entry. So they were baffled. They figured from this scene that this had to be a crime of passion, probably from someone she knew. And of course, because Linda was famous and many of the gossip columns talked about her just on the regular, the news of her death spread like wildfire. So there was a lot of public pressure in this case and police got to work right away and they figured maybe this could have been done by someone she was dating. So they looked at the two men that she had dated recently who were named Francisco and Raul, and they were both quickly ruled out. And I mean quickly, like a few hours after they discovered her body. So their next suspect was Natavia, the person who spent the most time with her these days and who was last with her that day. Natavia was questioned on the morning of Halloween, 2007, October 31st, and she actually was let go after a few hours of interrogation. And this was because she was actually brought in and questioned alone. And her lawyer called into the police and said that she could not be questioned any further without him being present. So they had to let her go. But police had a strong feeling that she could have had something to do with it because she was seen on security footage at the apartment leaving around the time that they suspect Linda had died. You can see in the footage that Natavia enters wearing khaki pants, a dark top, and she's carrying a manila folder. And this is approximately at 11.56 a.m. And when she leaves, which is about 1.19 p.m., she's holding the same manila folder, but now she has two bags with her, one green one that is swung around her back and one red one in her arm. She leaves the building and then returns shortly after with only the green bag in hand. When she comes back, she picks up what looks like a log book of some sort or maybe some type of mail and she sets it down and then leaves the building once again. Now it really stands out about this footage is you can see that when she comes back inside, you can see a better view of her pants and now they are being worn inside out. In the footage of her walking into the building, they're worn correctly with pockets facing outward. And this obviously indicates that she's probably flipped them inside out because she's hiding something, most likely blood. And at first, police did not want Natavia to know that they were kind of onto her and leaning in her direction. They did not want her to know that they had realized she had flipped the pants inside out. They wanted to kind of keep the trust with her. And over the next couple of days, investigators spent a lot of time in her apartment searching for evidence. And they actually took apart her bathtub and her drain pipes. They removed chunks of her carpet in the living room. They also took a whole door because they believed there was a fingerprint on it. But at first, there was actually no trace of Linda's killer. And after looking into the rest of Natavia's day, they learned that after leaving the apartment, she went to run some of the errands that Linda had previously asked her to. She got some lunch. She answered calls on Linda's behalf, telling whoever was on the other line that Linda was busy at the moment and unable to come to the phone. And at one point that evening, Natavia actually called up Linda's phone and left her a voicemail. Here it is. Hey, Linda, it's Natalia. Just want to let you know that I'm leaving work at 5.30. Hopefully the walk in the park was actually good. Um, I left everything upstairs um, at the door and Seymour called. Um, he said just give him a call back if he had a question to ask you. And I hope that the showing goes well with Ursula. Um, and I will see you tomorrow. So if you get this before 5.30, you can just call me. If not, talk to you later. Bye. But there wasn't enough physical evidence to prove that Natavia had actually been the one to kill Linda. They needed a confession. So then on November 7th, 2007, the Daily News leaked all of Natavia's criminal past. And this got a lot of people talking. This made everyone feel that she was the one who killed Linda. And people started swarming her apartments and journalists. And it really freaked her out. I mean all these people swarming outside of your door yelling things at you, of course, would freak anyone out. So she called the police to complain about it. And when the police talked to her, they were very sympathetic 
and they asked her to come in and talk to them, and she agreed. Two detectives met with her at Kellogg's Diner in Williamsburg to talk, and then the three of them went to a precinct on the Lower East Side. Natavia was at this precinct for almost like 14 hours, and then she was brought in for interrogation for about an hour and a half. Now, the entire interrogation was not filmed, but once Natavia was close to confessing, they turned on the camera, and most of that is public. However, I'm not sure how much of it I can include in this video. Copyright, you just never know. If I'm not allowed to include much of it, I will have it linked below. And it's honestly a really interesting interview to listen to. I definitely recommend checking it out, even if I am able to include a few clips here and there. So Natavia ended up confessing to the murder of Linda Stein without a lawyer present. In her confession, she says that Linda was yelling at her. She said she was sitting on Linda's couch and that Linda just kept yelling at her and was very aggressive that day. And it was also upsetting her because Linda was blowing smoke in her face and she felt like this was very disrespectful. And this whole time while Linda is screaming at Natavia, she is waving around this yoga stick. Now a yoga stick is used for posture mainly, you hold it behind your back and then kind of lean up against it. Even though Linda was a very temperamental person, she actually was really into the practice of yoga. They put it on their shoulders, they stretch, they turn. It looks like a king. And how long is it about? Mm, probably like the, the length of a king, but without that hook. Natavia says that Linda is waving this yoga stick in her face. She's blowing pot smoke in her face. She's screaming at her. She's getting louder and louder and more aggressive. She's just like in my face. And she's just like yelling and screaming and cursing. And I'm looking like, like asking myself, who the heck, like what the heck is going on? You know, I'm like, why am I here? Like what's going on? How did I get to this point? You know, I'm asking myself that and I'm like, Looking at her like, okay, what's wrong with her? You know, because she just looks crazy right now. Her hand is, you know, going like that. And then she takes it too far. According to Natavia, she makes a racist remark at her. So she's pointing the cane at me now, right? So I move the cane. You know how you just like slap it? Where were you? Still on the couch? Mm hmm So I'm still on the couch. <laughs> So she's like waving a cane and stuff at me. Natavia says that she heard Linda say racist things about other people or sometimes at other people. And she would tell her this, you know, Linda, that's not okay. Like I used to talk with her and just be like, you know, cause she used to always curse people out and stuff. Like she didn't care. She would, you know, always say like little racial things and I'll just be like, like, Linda, you can't do that, you know, and... Did you feel, feel insulted when she would say these racial things, even if they weren't and, about you? Right, you know, and then it's, I'll say sorry to the person, you know, and I'll just be like, I'm so sorry. And, you know, she's just having one of those moments. But she had never made one at her, and the fact that she had crossed that line was just too much. Apparently during the fight, Linda had offered to pay for Natavia's lunch that day. And Natavia said, no thanks, I have money to pay for my own lunch. Natavia says after she said that, Linda said, black people don't have any money. Save your money and I'll buy you lunch. And she said that is just when she snapped. She started seeing red. She actually describes seeing Linda as like an evil figure that her mind had just gone to a different place at that point. She grabs the yoga stick from Linda and starts beating her with it on the head. But I don't know, like after that remark and stuff and you know, her screaming and yelling, I just snatched it from her. And so I had took it and it's like, I just hit her with it. Where about her body? Like right here, but That's it's long, so. You know, it like reached. So you hit her the first one in the back of her head, and then what happened? And I did it like a couple more times. On her head? After the first time she fell? 
And then you continued to hit her on the head with the stick. Yes. I was mad. I was confused. I was angry, paranoid. It was like a feeling like I never had before. It felt like she was like my worst enemy, you know? So it's like, how do you go from somebody, you know, like a best friend, you know, to an enemy? She's hitting her on the back of the head over and over again with a ton of force. Natavia estimated that she hit Linda about seven or eight times, but it could have been more. She said that she did not know what came over her. It was unlike anything she had ever felt before. She was just suddenly filled with rage. So the autopsy results actually showed that Linda was beaten 24 times and she had five lacerations on her head from a blunt object. Her neck had also been snapped, which likely would have caused paralysis during the attack. And when police arrived, her body was in rigor mortis, meaning that she had been killed several hours earlier, likely sometime around noon. Also, the autopsy results showed that Linda had no THC in her system at all, meaning that the whole story about her smoking joints and blowing it in Natavia's face was not true. So Natavia was officially arrested for the murder of Linda Stein two days after her confession on November 9th, 2007. Police then searched her apartment and they found that Natavia had made expensive purchases on a company credit card for a former employer of hers and that those purchases were returned for cash. They also discovered that on the day of the murder, Natavia had withdrawn $800 from an ATM using Linda's credit card. Now there definitely was some pushback from Natavia's family about her arrest and they were very vocal and public about their feelings. They just felt like it wasn't possible that Natavia could have killed her, that it wasn't in her character. And they were also very upset that she she confessed without a lawyer present. The fact that she was in there for hours and then confessed without the lawyer there was a big point of contention in this case. But on Linda's side, many people doubted Natavia's story about how everything happened. They said that Linda rarely smoked weed around other people, that she was kind of embarrassed to do that and she would normally go in another room. And we also know that it was disproven because there was no THC in her system. Other friends of Linda's said that they highly doubt she made the racist remarks that Natavia claims that she did. They said that she was not known for doing that and it just wasn't in her character. They argued that she had many black friends and that she just wouldn't have said that. They admitted that she was loud, she was rude, she was abrasive, she was a lot of things, but they said that she just wasn't racist and that most people would not describe her this way. So police and many people who knew Linda and have followed this case believe that Natavia's story of what happened was partially true, that they definitely did get in an altercation and how she killed her was pretty accurate, but what led up to that moment is where they believe she was not telling the full story. Police believe, and most people believe, that Linda likely found out that Natavia was stealing from her, confronted her about it, and Natavia maybe got scared or got angry, had some reaction to that, and then started hitting her. And maybe it just started out with like one burst of anger and it went too far, and then she got to the point where she's like, shit, you know, this woman is super powerful, super wealthy, super well known, and this is going to destroy my life. And my best chance of getting away with it is killing her completely so she can't tell anyone what happened. Or it's possible she had planned to kill her from the beginning of the attack and possibly sometime before that. It's just not known. Mandy has come forward to say that her mother was an extremely forgiving person. And if Linda really did, you know, confront her about the money that she likely would have forgiven her. But no one truly knows what happened that day. No one knows if Linda did go too far, if she did make racist remarks, if maybe she was very upset about her stealing. Maybe she wasn't seeming like she was forgiving at all. Maybe she was threatening her. We have no idea what really kicked 
Natavia off to actually make the move to kill her. The first court hearing took place on December 13th, 2007. And during this initial hearing, Natavia was made aware of her charges and then would have to await her trial date. And during this hearing, Natavia's family actually stood up and interrupted the judge in court and accused Mandy, Linda's daughter, of being the one to kill her. They claimed that the two of them had a strained relationship, which it seems like they did to some degree. But this outburst immediately ended the hearing and Natavia waited in jail for two years for her trial to take place. And while in jail, Natavia gave birth to her daughter, who was then put in her family's custody. And she also recanted her confession during this time. When her trial finally began, her defense attorneys argued that Natavia was indeed a theft, but she was not a killer. And their main argument for this was that She just wasn't smart enough to pull off a murder without leaving a trace of evidence. They also argued that Natavia had kind of gotten by in life by telling people what they wanted to hear, what she thought they wanted to hear, and that's what led to her confessing. The defense also really questioned the timeline of that day. Natavia was seen leaving Linda's apartment around 1.19 that day, but Mandy said that she spoke with her mom around 2 o'clock that afternoon. Now, there's not that much information out there about this 2 o'clock phone call, about what was said or why they made this phone call or if they even did have this phone call. There is no proof of it as far as I know, but the defense definitely used this call as a way to cast doubt on Natavia as the killer. They also brought up that before Natavia actually confessed herself, she told the police a story about a masked man coming into the apartment and beating Linda with a hammer. Although if this happened... Wouldn't Natavia have done something or possibly have been injured herself? I mean, that story just didn't make sense from the beginning. This theory became known in the case as the ninja theory. And Natavia said that this person told her that she would be the last person to see Linda alive. But the story, like I said, was ridiculous. There was no way to back it up. It didn't make sense. And so it was completely dismissed. The defense also asked the jury the question, why would... Natavia kill Linda if she knew that Mandy was just going to be coming home soon and would find her. But the prosecution argued that this was not a planned attack from the beginning, that Natavia was not in her right mind, just as she said in her confession. The prosecution said that her intentions were bad from the beginning because she was stealing from Linda right away. They also were able to bring up all the past evidence from all the other crimes that she had committed before this. Natavia had opened two American Express accounts in Linda's name and forged a $4,000 check, which she used to donate to an organization that was offering free movie premiere tickets to any person who donated over a certain amount. The prosecution also noted that based on the security footage, Natavia was the only person of suspicion to enter or leave Linda's building that day. They said they believe that Linda did know that Natavia was stealing from her and she confronted her about it, which led to this fight and led to her death. Her daughter, Mandy, was the first to testify and her testimony went on for six hours. She was cross-examined by the defense and they brought up that she didn't have the most ideal relationship with her mother, but they got along to some degree. So the jury just did not buy that Mandy could have been the one to do this. So on May 3rd, 2010, Natavia was found guilty for the second degree murder of Linda Stein and sentenced to 27 years in prison, 25 for the murder and two more for the theft of more than $30,000. And during the sentencing, the judge actually said that Natavia had acted with uncommon and almost inhumane calculation. And he also said that while Mandy and Samantha were reading their victim impact statements, Natavia appeared completely unconcerned. Her daughters, Mandy and Samantha, actually tried to sue Douglas Elliman and Axion for their negligence in a wrongful death lawsuit. But in 2011, the court granted Axion's request to dismiss this motion, and the girls were unable to pursue any further legal action against them. And Linda actually did not have a will written, which is surprising for someone of her success and her age and her health pretty weird, but she didn't have a will. And so they just ended up granting Samantha and Mandy her estate. So that's where the case ends. Natavia is still in jail to this day. And some people believe that she's innocent, believe that it could have been someone else or could have been Mandy. But it seems like the majority of people agree that with all of the evidence and the security camera footage, her flipping her pants inside out, her making those calls, plus all of her past history, 
And the fact that she was stealing from Linda from the very beginning, it really seems that Natavia was the one who killed Linda Stein that day. But of course, I want to know your thoughts on this case. Let me know below what you think happened that day. But that is going to be it for me today, guys. I hope you found this one to be interesting. I certainly did. And before I go, I need to thank today's sponsor, Casetify. We love Casetify. I love how much you can customize these cases. So they really make great gifts for anyone else. And a lot of their cases, are made from bamboo-based materials and they are 100% compostable. You can really make these cases yours. You can change up the colors, the customizations. You can add photos to cases if you want. Casetify's cases are drop test approved and their impact and ultra impact cases are lined with Chitech 2.0, which is their impact absorbing material, which is engineered with a dual layer of construction to protect your phone from drops of up to 9.8 feet. And their cases feature Defensify, which is an antimicrobial coating that kills 99% of bacteria. Their cases are also non-toxic and non-hazardous. And what's awesome is their cases are also wireless charging and 5G compatible. So if you want to check out Casetify for yourself, you can get 15% off your order if you go to casetify.com slash Kendall. There will be a link below for that so you guys can take advantage of this deal. But that is gonna be it for me today, guys. I will see you next time, but until then, stay safe out there.